Hello, everyone. We're going to get started. This webinar is being recorded. Your phone line is muted. And please use the Q&A box for if you have any questions to, during our webinar. I'm Leslie Gabay Swanston, Director of Program and Systems Quality at the National Summer Learning Association. Just a quick overview of our webinar today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about NSLA. Then we'll hear from Beth Dutta, Director of Suncoast Campaign for Grade Level Reading at the Patterson Foundation. Beth will discuss how the Suncoast Campaign and their summer, Suncoast Summer Reading Challenge has brought together different sectors of the community to transfer summer, transform summer and how other communities can replicate their success. Then we'll have some time for questions and answers. As we're going along, I encourage you to type your questions into the Q&A box. There's also a chat box, but uh, your question might get lost in there. So please use the Q&A box if you want your question to be asked and answered. So a little bit about NSLA. The National Summer Learning Association is the only national nonprofit exclusively focused on closing the achievement gap by increasing access to high quality summer learning opportunities. NSLA's goal is to increase nationwide the number of high quality summer learning programs designed to close the achievement gap. To achieve this, NSLA recognizes and disseminates what works, offers expertise and support for programs and communities, and advocates for summer learning as a solution for equity and excellence in education. NSLA's work is driven by the belief that all children and youth deserve high quality summer learning experiences that will help them succeed in college, career, and life. Core to our work is the recognition that high quality summer learning works. High quality summer learning programs have been shown to improve reading and math skills, school attachment, motivation, and relationships with adults and peers. So why do we believe so strongly in summer? We know that summer is a time of great inequity for young people, and we believe that promoting and supporting summer opportunities is a way to address this. This goes beyond the summer learning that's in our name. We also want to see programs and communities addressing things like access to other resources like meals. Summer is a time of, is, is a time of innovation and exploration. Without some of the constraints of the school year, kids were able to try different ways of learning and interact with other adults and peers that they might not otherwise. It's also a time of innovation for adults, whether that is opportunities for professional development, new teaching methods, or exploring new partnerships. And you'll hear how, they, um, how Beth is leveraging partnerships from our guest speaker. Um, as director of the Sun Coast Campaign for Grade Level Reading, Beth works closely with local leader, lead partners to drive positive change in the region. To embed lasting change, the future-focused partners strive to collaborate with every sector, business, government, nonprofits, media, and individuals. So with that, I will hand things over to Beth. Thank you, Leslie. Um, we're delighted to be uh, presenting as part of this webinar today. I'm hopeful that as I am, uh, yes, the slides are switching. So I am Beth Judah. I'm the director of the Suncoast Campaign for Grade Level Reading, working with the Patterson Foundation. We are located on the Gulf Coast of Florida. And as many of you know, the Campaign for Grade Level Reading is a collaborative effort of states, I think it's um, over 400 communities across the nation now, working to ensure that children growing up in asset-limited families are succeeding in school and in life um, by focusing on an important indicator of success, which is third grade reading scores. Um, Research shows that proficiency in reading by the end of third grade enables kids to shift from reading to learn, uh, I'm sorry, from learning to read to reading to learn. And once they ha are able to read to learn, that helps them to master more complex subject matter, 
And the students who fail to reach this critical goal of learning to read by the end of third grade, they're more likely to falter in later grades and often drop out of school even before earning a diploma. Our national statistics right now, two thirds of US fourth graders, according to NAEP testing, are not proficient readers. And that statistic is even more disturbing when we look at four out of every five asset limited students miss this critical milestone. Now, we know that schools play an important role in helping all children achieve, but the campaign for grade level reading is based on the belief that schools can't do it alone. We need engaged communities to remove barriers, expand opportunities, and assist parents in fulfilling their roles and responsibilities in the success of their children. The Suncoast campaign for grade level reading is a four county effort. We are in Charlotte, DeSoto, Manatee, and Sarasota counties. And our region is focused on addressing the most common issues and obstacles that impact a child's ability to read. We focus our efforts on school readiness, zero to five years. What can we do to ensure our children arrive on the first day of kindergarten ready to learn? We look at improving school attendance. Many times the children who are struggling academically are missing more than 10% of the school year. And we're working with our school districts to curb those numbers. We also are very active in summer learning and I'm excited that I, I get to tell you about our Suncoast Summer Reading Challenge today. We know that summer is a critical time in educational development. It's instrumental in closing the achievement gap and many students, especially our students from historically disadvantaged groups, start the academic year with achievement levels lower than where they were at the beginning of summer. It's often referred to as a summer slide and their peers from moderate and higher income families are actually gaining reading skills over the summer. So, in many instances, that achievement gap is getting wider in the summer. And we know with concentrated efforts and community engagement, we can change that. Now, the critical dimensions of parent and family engagement and health issues impact all of those um, previous mentioned solution areas. And the Patterson Foundation's approach, the Suncoast campaign's approach, is organized around the principle that to learn, share, evolve, and strengthen, we must first be connected. And we are providing opportunities to bring people, businesses, not-for-profits, government, and the media together to define common aspirations in order to embed lasting change in our community. I'm gonna give you a quick picture of how we're structured. As a four county region, the Patterson Foundation is the regional accelerator. So we're looking at things that we can do in multiple counties at the same time. We download best practices from um, the National Campaign for Grade Level Reading and other thought leaders, as well as other campaign communities throughout the United States. We also have a lead partner in each one of our counties that is responsible for the county specific work that's happening. We're proud to partner with United Way Suncoast in Manatee and DeSoto County, with United Way of Charlotte County, and the Community Foundation of Sarasota County as our lead partners. We know that working together, we are going to be able to weave support for our, our children. We very often um, talk about it as weaving a network of support. We want to make sure that everyone can see themselves in part of the solution. And we use two different practices to inform our work. Um, the Harvard practice is rooted in an orientation, um, a mindset, if you will, of using the community as a reference point for creating change. So instead of coming up with 
solutions in our conference room. We want to actually be in the community, learning from the people who we are most trying to affect. And then uh, creating the future um, is uh, a method of looking at problems that we learned about through author Hilde Gottlieb. And it encourages the use of catalytic thinking to create positive results. So those results can be consistently replicated and scaled. A key phrase in the Harwood practice is turning outward. And turning outward helps us to get off the path of the status quo and onto a path of possibilities. When turning outward, we engage the community in new ways, we identify common aspirations, and instead of focusing on problems and looking at things through a lens of scarcity, by working together, we're looking through a lens of collective abundance. When we work together, there are more than enough resources. Now, the writings of Hilde Gottlieb lead us to some questions and, and uh, she poses to us that if we change the questions, we can change the world. So some of the questions that we look at before we embark on any initiative is what will success look like? For whom? What do we want to see? What will it take to create that? What resources do we already have to build upon? Who in our community has what we need? And what could we accomplish if we work with others to pool our resources? So for us, it's less about taking credit and more about getting the job done. This gives you a picture of where we currently are in our region. Our four counties are listed and these are the third grade reading scores from 2018 and 2019 according to our state-based assessment test. So as you can see, um, currently in Charlotte County, 69% uh, of our children are reading at grade level. In DeSoto County, 34%. In Manatee County, 51%. And in Sarasota County, 70%. So there's great room for improvement. And we are working with our community partners and not trying to squeeze something else into the already packed 14% of the time children are in school, we don't think that's the most effective approach. Now, some of you might be saying 14%. Yes, if you look at the number of hours the child is in school over the course of an academic year, it works out to be about 14%. Now, we're basing that on a six and a half to seven hour day of instruction. We hope our children are sleeping about 33% of the time, but that leaves uh, over 50% of the time that the children in our community are awake and out of school. And a time that we feel by working with community partners, we can make a big difference. And our out of school time providers and summer providers are a great way to start that. When we first looked in the, in the summer of 2017 um, to put together uh, some kind of a, a summer challenge, we were struck that the summer space was a little bit like the wild, wild west. Some programs were two weeks long, others were 11 weeks long. Some summer programs enrolled 30 kids, some enrolled 300 kids, others were a half day, some met for only four days a week. Um, some were run by the city, some were run by the county, some were run by churches. Um, some of the programs offered to our most asset challenged families were in churches or in YMCAs or boys and girls clubs. Uh, our school districts had Title I summer programs and also summer school put in place for um, third graders who are not reading on level and were in danger of having to repeat a year. There was very little alignment between the school districts and the summer providers and there was a great deal of perceived competition between programs. Uh, competition for enrollment in the programs, but also competition for grant dollars. So 
it was very unlikely that that we would see collaboration and we saw almost no collaboration um, between the school districts and our summer providers. Now, some of the programs that we researched did have um, academics offered to some of the children, but it was a pretty small cohort of children and most of those programs were grant funded and when the grants went away, so did the programs. We wanted to put something in place that could be scalable, that could elevate the entire system. When we looked at who was interacting with our children in the summer, in some cases it was high school children that were um, volunteering in summer camps or college age students. Um, and on the other end of that, we, we had degreed teachers that were helping the students, but we didn't have a uni uniformity in what was happening. And that's when the Suncoast Summer Reading Challenge was born. Now, I know the slide says Summer Book Challenge, um, and that's what it was called in 2017. Uh, in 2018 and 2019, we've been calling it the Suncoast Summer Reading Challenge. We came up with the challenge based on the work of James Kim of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. In one of his white papers, he published that regardless of family income, the effect of reading four or five books at a child's level over the summer was large enough to prevent a decline in reading achievement scores from spring into fall. And we used that as the hook. Now, this initiative doesn't award grants. Rather, we ask the summer providers to opt in. And they opt into the program by agreeing to report weekly and to participate fully in the initiative. And we have a, a list of the requirements to participate fully. Some of the things on that list include involving the families in the initiative over the summer. Um, we include how they, they will be uh, rewarding and awarding the children who are reading multiple books over the course of the summer. We have um, a few requirements for um, the information that we need to get from uh, each provider so that we can get outcome measurements each year. We have an agreement with the school districts in our four counties that they will give us the reading assessment scores for the children, the very last diagnostic test that the children take in the spring. And we compare that to the first diagnostic test the children take in the fall to get a clear idea of summer reading gains, we hope, or summer reading loss, if we have that. And we have incentivized participation. So for us, the motivation in this program is to improve summer reading scores across the whole system. For many of our summer providers, the motivation is the weekly stipend and supports that the Patterson Foundation has put into place. And a few slides down the way, I'll, I'll go over what those um, stipends and supports are. But it's important that you hear why the children are motivated. And it's because we give away brightly colored silicone bracelets for every book a child reads over the summer. And we have found that children will work really hard to get a collection of bracelets. So the growth of the Suncoast Summer Reading Challenge has been um, quite remarkable over the last three years. And, and this graph will help you see that. We started in 2017 with two counties. In 2018, we operated in three counties, and this past summer, 2019, we had four counties involved. The number of participating providers, in 2017, we started with 22. In 2018, we had 83. And in 2019, we had 97 participating summer providers. 
The number of participating students has grown each year. We started with 2,600 and this past summer we had 8,709 children participate in the program. And of those 8,709 children, 6,876 actually completed the challenge by reading at least six books over the course of the summer. And the total number of books read in 2019 were 198,570 books. And yes, we did give away bracelets for all 198,570 books. The output measurements are, are nice to have and they help us to build participation and momentum over the summer, but it's the outcome measurements that are really evaluating the effectiveness of the initiative. So as you're looking at this slide, I'd like you to keep in mind that the average low-income child loses between two and three months of reading skills over the summer. You can see on this slide in 2018, 60% of the participating children stayed at least even in reading skills. That's if you look at even and summer learning gain, 41 and 19%. 41% of the participating children in 2018 actually gained reading skills. We had 15% to um, had less than a one-month loss, 18% that had a one-month loss, and um, had some locations, six locations that we were unable to score. The reason for that is we have an aggregate data sharing agreement with our school district. So if the sample group is too small from any one location, we're unable to get the scores for that. Now, in 2019, we had um, 50% of the participating children staying at least even in reading skills with 35% actually experiencing reading gain. We're really proud of the results and we're determined to improve even more in the summer of 2020. Now we know um, that engagement with staff and families will pay a significant role in continued improvement as well as training and professional development. Now, this will give you an idea of the kind of supports that we have in place for the participants. So with programs that have more than 10 and less than 30 participating students, we provide $400 for staff orientation and training and $200 a week for each week the program is in session. With programs that have more than 30 children, but less than 60 children participating, we have that same $400 for staff orientation, um, but we're giving $500 a week for every week the program is in session. And then for programs that have more than 60 participating students, we add five additional dollars per week for every participating child once a total of 60 has been reached. And that's capped at a, a total of $1,000 per week. Building the excitement and the capacity of the front lines is really important. In 2000, oh, I pressed that by mistake. In 2017, we discovered that although we had great alignment at an administrative level for all of our summer providers, that being translated to the front lines, to the people who are actually working with the children, um, wasn't happening as uh, richly or robustly as we would like. So we began to add things um, to the program to have greater connection with the frontline staff and to give greater support to that staff so they would have things that they could do with the children. We gave uh, toolkits for parents. 
And one of the things that um, the children really like, they love getting stickers. So we put our integrity pledge for the summer reading challenge on a sticker that we um, passed out to every participating child and also gave information to all of our providers that they could send home with the parents to really get involvement. As we asked ourselves uh, what success would look like, we knew that we needed to have more training for the frontline staff, the people who were actually working with the students. And we created what we call a summer blast off event. We ask for a minimum of two people from every participating summer provider to attend, but the invitation is open to all staff members. And during this half day training, we get some of the best educators in our region to give us their most inspiring lesson plans. We strip those uh, lesson plans of all educational jargon with the thought that we want to provide all of our summer providers with an easy to follow guideline on what they can do with their students. We produce a book that has all of the lesson plans from the summer blast off in it. And we track the participants so that we make sure that every location has hands-on experience with at least six high quality lessons that they can replicate in their own summer programs. This blast off guide um, has all of the lessons from the, the summer blast off and we encourage providers to use it over the summer. We also produce a weekly newsletter during the summer where we take best um, practices that are happening in camps and we put a, a spotlight on that so that the other camps and other summer providers can replicate what's happening. This is a picture from our half day training. We include the hands-on activities designed to inspire a lifelong love of learning. We have opportunities built in throughout the day for our providers to learn and share with each other. And we also include um, motivating presenters who are focused on helping raise the level of engagement and raise the capacity for all of the people who are working with our children. At the summer blast off, because we have involvement from all of the summer providers, we are able to hand out supplies during the day. So we give each one of our um, summer providers a bin that's filled with bracelets, filled with um, materials and suggestions for their success, as well as instructions on how to do their weekly recording. We also have the opportunity at the blast off to connect each summer location with a member of our Suncoast campaign for grade level reading engagement team. Each summer location has one specific person that they will engage with over the course of the entire summer. That person is available to them to answer any questions they might have, to connect them with resources that they might need, and to help motivate them through the summer. Um, particularly in our programs that run 10 or 11 weeks, we find having that guide on the side and that motivational coach for the last four or five weeks of summer can really make a difference. We also um, have all of our reporting forms as Google Docs to make it as easy as possible for our summer providers to complete their information and to get it to us in a timely way. We believe that the success of our Suncoast Summer Reading Challenge um, really rests a great deal in the flexibility that we give our providers. We are not prescriptive with the funds that we have available. 
So uh, we have some providers who use the funds that um, we share with them to hire summer staff. Some of our locations use it to hire teachers to come in and do specific reading lessons with their kids. Some of our other providers have um, a dearth of reading materials. So they use our support dollars to purchase high quality reading materials for the children in the, in the summer. We have some of our um, providers who use those funds to um, have professional development for their teachers to build more capacity. I think having our outcome measurement in place for this program has really helped us with the success. We're not adding another test to um, our children. Our districts already use um, computerized programs. Two of our, our districts use um, STAR 360 Renaissance and two of our districts use iReady. And those um, programs have built in assessments three times a year for the children. By using that information that the schools are already gathering and not adding another layer of testing, I think that has really helped us have as much involvement as we have. And we've learned that having our engagement team make weekly contact with the people who are involved in our program has really helped. Uh, this is a, a picture of the silicone bracelets that the, the children um, have earned over the course of, of the summer. And um, I'm uh, uh, finished in, in filling you in, but I would love to hear any questions that you might have about the program or um, any uh, additional information that you would like to receive. Great, thank you, Beth, uh, for sharing the amazing work you, you all are doing in the Sun Coast. Uh, hopefully our audience was able to pick up some ideas they can implement in their communities. Um, so we're gonna open up for questions right now. Um, again, if you have a question for Beth, please type it in the Q&A box. Beth, you, you mentioned that you were able to get aggregated data and you have a data sharing agreement with the school districts. Can you talk a little bit about how you were able to establish that? Yes. Um, truly by building relationship. So the school district was very interested in having children return to school at the same level or a higher level than when they departed school. And because we, make, we made it easy for the school district to be able to share that data with us by giving them um, those measurement outcomes that they are already collecting anyway. They, they already have the, the iReady testing and the Renaissance testing in place to do an assessment before the kids leave for the summer and an assessment when they come back at the end of summer. So we do a lot of the legwork um, by providing the school district with a list of students that we would like to receive those scores for. We make sure that um, we have a relationship with the, the data folks in each one of the districts so that if there are any issues, we're the ones that are doing the legwork to you know, check that birthday or check the spelling of the name to make sure. And um, we work with them um, all year now because we, summer is not the only uh, data need that we have with the campaign. In our larger school districts, the Patterson Foundation has provided funding for a data tech position in those schools. Um, our agreement with them is that if the Suncoast campaign for grade level reading has a data request, that we go to the top of the list. And at the times when we don't have a data request, the school district can use that data tech position for whatever they would like 
to do. And we put that in place simply because we discovered it was a capacity issue. The very first year we asked for data, the school district was very willing to give us the data, but it was taking a really long time. And when we um, investigated a little further, we discovered it was a capacity issue. It wasn't that they weren't willing to share the data, it was they didn't have the body in place who could easily pull that data while um, doing all the other things that they, they had to do. So in our larger districts, we do fund a data position. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you're this, the reading challenge is you're working in, in four different counties um, and you have, I'm sure, this number, number of, of, of partners in, in the different communities. How do you balance or resolve conflicting interests between those partners or localities? Can, so give me an example of what conflicting interest would be. So for, I think you mentioned that some of the counties were using different uh, assessments at different times, or I, how do you decide kind of how, um, if there's if a certain location is doing something differently and they want to do it that way, um, how do you kind of come to agreement on that? Yeah. So as, as far as the assessment um, goes, we, we, we are using whatever assessment the school district is using. We, we saw in our first couple of years with um, investigating summer that some of our summer providers were using other assessment tests. So they, they weren't necessarily aligned to what the school district was measuring. They were doing a post or a pre and post test of their own showing that the children had had gains during the summer. But when we compared that to the information that the school had, it didn't always hold up. So we made the decision that we were going to assess summer based the very same way that the school district assesses summer. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as what each one of the programs does, there, there you know, is a big difference between what Parks and Rec does and what our Title I summer camps do that are affiliated with the school districts. Our requirement to be considered a full participant is that you have at least two events each week that the focus is to um, foster a love of learning. And through our engagement team members being in direct contact with each one of the summer providers, we're able to get details on what those activities are, and then also make suggestions on how they might make those activities a little more robust, or um, in, in many cases, we're making uh, suggestions on how they can get parents more involved. And in many cases, as they're sharing their plans with us, that's when we discover some of the gaps um, that are in place. Um, for example, last summer, we had one of our summer providers that is a little more remote. It's not in our, our, um, the center of our county, but is in an area we call South County, cleverly, we've titled it South County. And as they were sharing it with us, we discovered that they didn't have access to a lot of books. And all we had to do then is, is make a couple of phone calls and the public library system agreed to um, take them books once a week. And then we had somebody else who stepped up to the plate and um, provided um, busing so that the children could actually visit the library a couple of times over the summer. So when, when we say we're trying to look at this through a lens of collective abundance, that's what we're talking about, is, is how can we um, discover what the needs are for each one of our summer providers, and then make the connection with the people who have the thing that the summer provider needs. Thank you. Um, again, if you have a question for Beth, go ahead and type that in the Q&A box and we'll answer those. I'll read those out loud. 
Um, there's a question. Do you see the program growing and changing to adapt to that growth in the next few years? Will the program become more enhanced to encourage more reading and retention? Yes, um, we, we definitely see that. So the, the conclusion of last summer, we, we took not only our output um, data, but also our outcomes evaluation, and then put another level of evaluation on that as well. We, we did um, community conversations with uh, providers that fell in our you know, most outstanding providers, people who were in the middle of the pack, and then also our providers who, whose outcomes weren't as robust as we would have liked to have seen, and did in-depth conversations, not only with those administrators, but also as many of the frontline staff as we could to get their feedback about um, how the, the program was going and what their perceived uh, obstacles or, or roadblocks were to getting um, the results that you know we all agree we'd like to see. So based on those conversations, we're going to be um, tweaking the program for summer 2020. We're looking at some um, early milestones that we can build into the program so that if we, we have a, a summer provider who maybe isn't getting the kind of um, involvement that, that they would like to see, that we have things in place to bolster it earlier. Um, I don't know that our support package is going to change. Um, one of the things I didn't mention is not only do we have uh, the weekly supports in place, but we do a, a bonus program at the end of the year, and that's based entirely on the outcome measurements. So if your children have reading gains, you would be eligible for your entire bonus. And I, I think the cutoff point uh, this year was um, losing a month and a half of, of reading proficiency, you would, you would still be eligible for a small percentage of your bonus. And we're looking at changing that a little bit um, this year. I'm not sure exactly where we're going to land, but, but we truly want the bonus dollars to reward our summer providers who are doing the best job of engaging students parents and community partners. So I imagine we'll see some changes this year based around the feedback we got from those community conversations. Um, and I, I, we have a question kind of, I think you might've answered it, uh, um, but uh, would there also be higher reward scales for programs that meet and greatly exceed expectations in upcoming years or more based on rewarding higher achievers? Yeah, so, you know, I think our, our level of supports will be the same for, for all providers because we don't, we don't want to get our entire system into a competition um, for dollars. However, yes, we, we do have a program in place to reward um, the folks that are getting uh, the best outcomes, but, but not only rewarding them but also designing into that reward how we can share their success with others. So not only to reward them for the success they've had, but how can we use that success to influence our other summer providers so that we're raising the water level of the entire system. Can you talk a little bit about how you've been able to engage other partners in your community? Yes. So, um, you know, we consider anyone who's involved um, with the, the campaign uh, a partner. So as we looked at um, our summer providers and, and wanting them to partner with us, we had our likely suspects, right? Our boys and girls clubs, our YMCAs, but we also um, were looking for where else are our children? So we have um, public housing uh, involved. It, it, if, we, if we look where the children are, we kind of follow that. And then in order to, to have um, 
a lot of partners, that means we have to do a lot of relationship building and we have to do uh, a lot of presentations on what it is we're trying to do. So we speak at Rotary Club meetings and Kiwanis Club meetings. We have um, ongoing meetings with, um, when we ask ourselves the question, who else cares about this? Those are the people that we want to meet with to see if they could partner with us in some way. And we continue um, to think of the campaign for grade level reading as a movement. And we're always looking to build the movement by, by adding more people into that bucket, by asking the question, who else cares about this? So even some of our largest providers or our largest employers in the area have become partners with us certainly because they have so many of their employees that have children and and they want to make sure those kids are successful but also because the children in the summer camps now are the workforce of tomorrow and many of our businesses their customers have children so the more that we can bring them all in so it's communicating with people and then following up on those communications and making everyone see the the thread that they are in this tapestry of support that we're trying to weave everyone in our communities has a role to play in this and i think it's our job to help help them find which role is best for them mm -hmm. Um, what has been the, the biggest challenge with bringing these partners together? And is there anyone you haven't been able to partner with yet that you still would like to pursue? Well, sure, because we don't have everybody <laughs> yet. We want everybody. Um, so I, quite honestly, I think our biggest challenge, not only in the summer space, but in um, all of the work we do, our, our biggest challenge is in the difference between compliance and a pursuit of excellence. If, if we are working with people and all they want to do is the minimum in order to, you know, comply with, we're not going to get the results we need for our children. I believe our job is to help inspire um, all of our partners to go beyond compliance and that if we if we keep connected to our aspiration our our aspiration is we want all of our children to be successful and and that means not giving up after you've tried to reach a parent two times and mm -hmm. That means being willing to stay five extra minutes if, if a family needs something. It, it, it means being willing to go out of our comfort zone to make a phone call um, to, you know, someone we don't know because we believe they might have something that would help us deliver better services to our kids. So mm -hmm. I, I think our biggest, our biggest challenge is um, in the inspiration department to, to keep ourselves motivated and and inspired but also to motivate and inspire others to give our children what they deserve mm -hmm. um going back to the, the data and the data sharing we had a question uh would there be a way for all providers to share data with each other um, as you said to enhance and raise the bar for everyone well um Yes. Yeah, so what what we do is, um, you know, we have we have a pledge with all of our partners that we will never use data as a weapon. That you know the purpose of data is to um, point out what we're doing right and help us know where we need to adjust and and operate a little bit differently. So at the end of the summer, we do share. Um, data again it's aggregate data so we're not you know specifically saying susie smith did great but we are able to say the the children at the um, north shore boys and girls club gained an average of 1.3 months of reading skills over the summer 
and our neighbor, the East Shore um, Boys and Girls Club, their children didn't do quite as well. Maybe they, you know, lost a half a month. So by looking at that and then sharing between those two organizations, what did the North Shore do that East didn't do? And how, how can we better inform and share um, the, the practices that do work? So yes, we do, we do share data among the people who are involved, but again, we never use it as a weapon. So it, it, we don't use it to shame anyone. We use mm -hmm. it as a way to inspire folks to um, make the changes they need to make to get even more effective. That's great. Um, so we have a couple questions about about scaling. Um, do you think that you would be able to spearhead a statewide challenge in the next coming years? Do you see that as a viable option or goal? Um, and would you think that there would be enough funding to support a large scale challenge or operation like that? Yeah, I you know so I. I would I love to see that? Yes, I would love to see that. How, however, um, I think you know part of the reason this program program has been successful is because of the uh, engagement team members we have, and that kind of um, ongoing training, the connection. So I I worry that if we if we scaled up. To, like if we were running it in larger than our region, we, we would lose that connection. So I, I think, is this the type of thing other communities could do? Absolutely. Is there enough funding available? I think so. Now it wouldn't necessarily be funding from me because I have a, you know, a, a certain budget, but if you are asking yourself the questions, who else cares about this? We know that our school districts care about it. Our out of school time providers care about it. Our county governments care about it. Our city governments care about it. Uh, we have private philanthropy that cares about it. We have juvenile justice funds that are available. So by having the kind of program we're doing and all of those different folks can participate in it, yes, I. I I do think um, that there's enough. It's just a matter of bringing the right people to the table. Um, and so finally, I just want to ask if you have any advice you would give, want to give to someone who's just starting out on this path, kind of building an equitable barreling program like yours. Um, is there one place that you would suggest that they start? Well, I. I I, I think I'm going to, rather than advice, just make an offer. Um, all of our materials are available um, on our website. And I, I would say that that would be a great place to begin. And if you wanted even more detailed information, we'd be happy to share that um, with anybody. So, you know, our, our templates, our reporting, how we're, um, operating in each one of the counties. We'd be happy to share all of that. You know, we have a project framework for summer that lists everything that, that we do um, in preparation. And we would be happy to share that with anybody who would like it. And um, we give full permission for you to, you know, change our logo to be your logo and go forth. Great, that was such a great, uh, great offer. Um, I have your contact information up on the screen right now. So if anybody um, like a, like best suggests, if you want to get in contact with her, um, sounds like she's waiting <laughs> for you to reach out. Yeah. Oh, we're, we, we are happy to share. We've already seen the, the program replicated in other parts of, of the country, maybe not at the same scale that we're doing it here, but um, we, we certainly want to have all our materials as open source materials, if they can be helpful to any other community. Great, great. Um, all right, I think we're going to wrap up there. Um, I have a um, 
thank you for all your questions, and thank you again, Beth, for being with us today. Um, I'm going to wrap up with just a couple of announcements. Um, the first is National Summer Learning Week will be July 6th through the 11th. Um, it's the week that we celebrate all things summer, and we'll have special themed days and new resources to share. Uh, we encourage communities and programs to let us know how you're celebrating summer, summer whether it's that week or any time during the summer, uh, by posting your summer programs or events on our tracker. Um, and I also want to let you know that NSLA's annual Summer Changes Everything Conference will be November 16th through the 18th in Washington, D.C. this year. Um, it's always a great way to meet other folks in the summer field and learn about new resources and ideas that you can use. Um, I know people always tell us that they leave our conference pumped up and motivated to get started planning for the next summer. Uh, so we would love to have you uh, join. Uh, look out for announcements about early bird registration soon. And speaking of announcements, be sure to be following us on our social media so you get the latest updates from us. Thank you again for joining us today. Um, have a good rest of your day, and we'll be in touch. Goodbye.